And we're live. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us with MASH Reads. Um, MASH Reads is Mashable Social Book Club, where we bring together authors and the Mashable community to talk about the best in new literature. Um, this month, we're joined uh, by James McBride, author of The Good Lord Bird. Um, thank you for coming, James. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, the Good Lord Bird is a satire telling the tale of Little Onion. Um, uh, a slave was freed um, or kidnapped, depending on you ask, uh, by John Brown. Um, it's a satire on this abolitionist quest. Um, so to get started, uh, James, could you tell me a little bit what um, inspired you to write this book? Why recover history in a satirical way? Well, because history is, you know, um, history is hard for a lot of people to read, but it's interesting to me. Um, um, I wanted to do it in a way that was funny, and I wanted to write a book that uh, you know, that, that I would read if I were writing, you know, if I were reading a book about history. And I love those kinds of books that are funny, that make fun of things that are that are not supposed to be funny. Uh, right. There's a lot of you can do a lot with comedy. You can do a lot with you know uh, things that are supposed to be serious that uh, that that you that you kind of poke fun of. <laughs> Um, why specifically um, the tale of John Brown? Um, well, well, John Brown was a, was he was an interesting cat, man. He was super bad. I mean, he was a white guy who decided in eighteen in the eighteen fifties basically that slavery was wrong, mm -hmm. and he was going to end it by himself. And so he uh, conducted a war against it uh, with nineteen other guys, uh, with some help from his. Uh, his wife and his daughters and a few other women, and he um, he, he fought a war against slavery. He was he really was quite a, he was a he was a true American hero. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was white and that he was uh, that he thought slavery was wrong, and during that era era during the 1850s was just that was out of this world, you know. So I just thought he was really interesting. Um, and that's something you kind of like draw out in the book. Um, you you said he was a cool cat, and that whimsy is definitely um, a big part of his character and the narrative of the Good Lord Bird. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like just kind of putting that character or kind of mapping those feelings onto that historical figure? What was that like? Well, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I say there are lots of books written about John Brown. Mm -hmm. that lots of people don't read. So I wanted to create a book that people would read that was funny, that would be informative about him, uh, as well as funny and, and entertaining. So, um, you know, I, I, I just think he's such a hero and he's so misunderstood uh, that the only way to see him fully is to see his good and bad parts without saying these are good and bad parts. Mm -hmm. and from the perspective of a kid, who sees him as he is, and the kid doesn't want to be with him in the first place because he basically kidnaps this little, little boy who has to pose as a girl because John Brown believes he's a girl. And you can't tell John Brown anything because he, you know, he's John Brown. You know, and he knows everything. Um, and that's one of the biggest, I want to call it a plot twist, but it happens pretty early on in the book, that this boy, Henry, has to pose as a girl, Henrietta. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your decision to, uh, to have that switch? You know, well, I always wanted to be a girl, and this was my time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was great, I loved it, you know, I was so old to go home, I didn't give anybody my phone number, none of that, you know. So, I mean, uh, it just was, um, <clears throat> there are too many books written, you know, from the perspective of a child's innocence that don't work. Mm -hmm. People assume children uh, are, like, stupid and they're not really that smart or that, you know, and they try to be innocent. And I wanted to create, a, you know, a character that was really just like kids really are, except that he happened to be a slave who was in the wrong time and in the wrong place. So that's kind of how... I mean, that's why Onion became Onion, you know. <laughs> John Brown just decided that this little boy was, uh, was, was a girl. And, and the kid had no choice but to go along with it because this, this old guy was crazy. Yeah, that definitely adds to kind of the, um, 
Yeah, that definitely adds to the whimsy of this of the story, right? Because John Brown is such a, a a crazy, kooky character, as you see. But then having this extra element of this boy having to pose as a girl kind of provided an interesting perspective. Um, we're also joined by a 2014 Mash Reads author, Molly Antipool, um, who's joining us to talk about The Good Lord Bird. Um, hi, Molly. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thanks for uh, um, I know as a fellow author, you had a few questions for um, John Brown, as, uh, sorry, for James McBride as, as well. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to you. Oh, sure. Hi. Can you see me? Yes, of course. Okay, good. I can't figure out the computer thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I was so happy to to get to talk to you. This is I love this book so much, and and I and and I just feel like it combines all the things that I that that I love the most about a good book. Like, just it's it's so funny and it's so compassionate and big hearted, and it's just so it just feels like such a just a story. Like, just and the way that it just sort of nods to classic storytelling. Also, I just I just admire so much. Um, and one of the things that that really really struck me about it was the voice and just how, you know, just how it felt so natural just to have someone just sort of like holding on to this giant whopper and it almost feels like that kind of like front porch or, or stoop story where someone's just sitting down and telling you a story. And I wondered how that voice arrived for you. That voice, well, actually, I had the voice a long time ago. I just never had a place to put it. Huh. Like years ago, I, you know, I grew up in a house where people talk like that. Um, and because uh, most of my relatives were from the South. Uh, but I just never found a place for it. So, I, I mean, in reality, I started writing this book, you know, many years ago, maybe 20 years ago. I would pick it up, I would, you know, I, I would, you know begin it. I, I would begin the voice talking without knowing who that person was and what their particular conflict and crisis was going to be. And then I would put it down because I could go nowhere after five pages. I, you know, I just there was nothing to say. But when I, I started, I just happened to visit Harper's Ferry one time, and I saw the exhibit there they have about John Brown. They have a whole museum dedicated to John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry, which was America's biggest arsenal at the time. And um, I just, I just, what, what, I just was trying to figure out what, what kind of, what way could I get into this story that's different and unique. And that would pull the reader along, and that voice came to me, and uh, and it was a fun voice. I mean, I love those kinds of characters, those old black guys who talk with the southern, you know, they talk old-fashioned. It's like the blues almost, you know, and you get to hear it again and again on every page. And I, I just, it, for me, it was just a wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. Oh, should I ask more questions? Um, I actually wanted to open it up to the community um, and just chat with you guys. Uh, what were some of your favorite parts of the book, and what parts of the book stuck out to you? Okay, well, I can jump in. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I loved the prologue to the book. Um, I don't know if that really counts as my favorite part, but I just loved how it started, and I felt like that beginning section, um, I was born a colored man, and don't you forget it, but I lived as a colored woman for 17 years. Like, right at the start, I was already like, intrigued, curious, and did you ever consider not putting in the prologue? Um, like, how did you come to the point of giving that kind of, like, flashback section right away at the beginning of the novel? You mean the, the prologue that starts with the fire at the church? Yes. Well, the prologue was written last. Okay. And, and it was rewritten many times because I wrote the book without the prologue. I didn't want the prologue in the book. Because when I read books, I don't read the prologue. I don't care. I don't care who's in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in the prologue. I mean, I want to, you know, let's get, I want, let's just start mouth kissing straight away. Okay. <laughs> you know, let's get to it, you know? Yeah. An old man talking now, just understand what young folks. <laughs> But I just, I just, uh, what happened was when the editor read it, he said, you need to set it up some kind of way. And so I wrote several different prologues. I wrote a prologue that was about this guy comes home. He's a real snobby, upper class, black guy from, like, you know, Providence, Rhode Island. He comes home and he finds out that his, you know, his relatives are, are like, black and they're related to John Brown some kind of way and he doesn't get the money until he goes and discovers 
John Brown, and I, I got locked up in that, and I tossed that. Yeah. I tried a couple of other different approaches, and I just settled on the whole idea of a fire and these papers being discovered, and so that you, so the prologue only lasts two pages. The magic of the book really is in the voice of onion. Mm -hmm. Now, the first chapter I rewrote, I mean, if I rewrote it 50 times, I wrote it once. I rewrote it a whole bunch, because mm -hmm. I know that, you know, if you don't pull people in the first few pages, you know, you forget it. So, I rewrote that first line. That first line of the book, I rewrote it several different ways, many, many times, much more so than anything else in the book. The first five or six drafts of the, of the book have been rewritten so much that you wouldn't recognize the first draft. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, it sounds like uh, you really thought about how you're presenting the book and uh, offering it up to the reader. Um, I know that The Good Lord Bird is, was recently announced that it's going to be made into a film. And so I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about that process of adapting um, a book like The Good Lord Bird into a movie. Well, <clears throat> how that works is, you, you know, you give it to an agent in Hollywood and they call you later on and they say that, you know, someone's interested in making a movie and that's the end of that. You know, you just go out and eat your hominy grits and your peanut butter and jelly sandwich and get all about it. You don't really have that much to do with it. I mean... Uh, Liev Schreiber and um, uh, uh, Will Smith's son, I think his name I can't remember at the moment, um, Jaden Smith have attached themselves to it, and which is very exciting, you know, and I hope they make it, you know. Uh, they're both extremely gifted actors, um, but I don't have much to do with it, you know. I'm, I'm, you write the book and you, you try your best to forget about it. Do you think that that transition from book to movie is going to affect how the story is told at all? Are there any parts that you think would be more evocative or that you really want um, to stress in the movie version? A good question. Um, a movie, it depends on who the director is and who the screenwriter is. Um, as long as John Brown is depicted as the, as the kind of crazy but morally sound person that he, turned, that he was, I have no objection to however it's presented. I mean, I just want people to know who he was. I think the reason why John Brown is important is because, you know, the moral questions that he raised during slavery are still pertinent today. They're not always pertinent with, you know, with, with regard to race, but they are to some degree. And they're certainly pertinent with regard to class and with regard to how we treat uh, poor people in this country. General. And in that regard, John Brown is, you know, truly uh, was truly a pioneer and also someone that we should study a lot. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the book because it, you can't make a guy like this up, you know. And he's a distinctly American cat. I mean, no one like him in, in you know in European history. Really. He's just a, a unique guy. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about the book is how it calls attention to this specific point in history. But it is a controversial time. Did you face any type of uh, backlash for bringing this satirical approach to covering such a heavy point in history? Well, most of the time when people have something bad to say about you, they don't say it while you're in the room anyway. You know, they just blog it on the net or whatever. And I don't read, you know, I don't read much about myself, so I... I can't say that I've got much backlash. There has been, in person, though, there has been some, uh, some, 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 you know, concern and criticism about my predict my uh, depiction of Frederick Douglass, who is lampooned in the book. Uh, you know, cause, because he meets Onion and he's, you know, they have they have a few drinks, they get a little toasty, and then he starts to get a little fresh, and you know, she drinks him under the table, and he falls out, and you know, some people were not happy about that. But the fact is, I mean, um, first of all, it's better that people know, you know, most people don't even know who Frederick Douglass is other than a picture, or John Brown for that matter. But the other part is I make fun of everybody in that book. I mean, the book is a satire of slaveholders, slave holders, um, abolitionists, and even in some cases the slaves themselves. Um, but these are exaggerated caricatures of the time, uh, you know, and uh, not necessarily accurate in terms of how people behave, but how people could and can behave. And that's what a caricature should be. 
Great. Um, and I think we have uh, time for one or two more questions. Um, so I just wanted to field the, the discussion back to our community room. Does anybody there have any questions for um, James and Brian? Yep, we have one over here. Okay. Yeah, I, I really like uh, John Brown's quixotic nature and how, how people sort of you know, viewed him as delusional but played along because he was so, you know, because of the force of his character. And I wondered if, if that was, <laughs> if that's resonant for you? Is, or do, you, do you experience yourself as being like that? Or are you? <laughs> like John Brown in that, in the sense of being, you know, listening to my own voice, breathing my own carbon monoxide, and thinking, I mean, carbon dioxide, and thinking that it's. Well, I meant it in the positive sense, too, of, of kind of. Say that again? I meant it in the positive sense, too, of sort of compelling people through the, by the force of your will. Oh, well, <clears throat> I mean, writers have a lot of influence. They don't have, they're not the main voice of moral reason and discourse. I think that's kind of an individual choice. Um, I like to think that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, I try to set a good example for younger people, younger writers, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I'm, I don't kid myself. I couldn't do the things that John Brown did, or the 19 others that accompanied him did. I mean, these guys were so, they were so brave, they were unconscious. I mean, they, they were just on a completely different level. But, um, you know, I like to think that, you know, I tried to live up to some of the ideals that he represented. Great. Um, and I think that's a, a great note to end on. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us for our Mashable Reads Google Hangout. Um, thank you to everybody from our community who joined us in New York. And thank you, James, for coming in and talking to us about the good Lord Bird. Um, this is Mashable Reads, and we will see you next month. Bye. 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 Bye.